Thanks so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. And I, and I appreciate the pain you're about to go through to listen to this. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to really enjoy it, so it's going to be OK. Um, so after that introduction, what the heck am I doing giving a talk on reverse engineering Chinese censorship? I don't actually know anything about censorship or didn't before I started this project. Um, I don't speak Chinese. I'm not really an engineer. But I do sometimes do stuff backwards. So, um, so um, what, we, what, what um, Jen and Molly, my two graduate students, and I were doing, um, by the way, Jen is going to start at Stanford in the fall, and uh, Molly starts at UCSD in the fall. Um, they're awesome. You should meet them. Um, what we were doing is we were interested in methods of automated text analysis. Um, and so what is that? Well, we were interested in studying social media. So in social media, that's what is that? That's the largest increase in the expressive capacity of the human race in the history of the world. Any one of you can write a social media post, and at least in principle, billions of people can read it. So that's amazing. However, none of you can understand what billions of people are saying all at the same time. And that's primarily because of your inadequacies. That, that's because you're human, right? That's sort of the way it works. Um, by the way, if anyone wants to interrupt me, I would really enjoy that. <laughs> um, so, uh, so social media is great for broadcasting. It doesn't tell us how to understand what everybody has to say. We can use traditional methods by trying to read what everybody has to say, but it's not going to work. Right? There's just way too much to try to understand. The only way, the only way we're going to understand what billions of people are saying is by some computer system, some automated methods. It'll never work if the computers are supposed to do it all. It'll never work if the humans are going to do it all. The only way is to have human-led, human computer-assisted methodology. So that's what we were trying to develop. We developed these methods in English. And we thought, well, how are we going to stress test them? Let's stress test them, push them until they break. Not the voice, the, uh, the methods. Um, we push the, push the methods until they break, and that's the way we understand. So we thought, let's try them in Chinese. As it happens, Jen and Molly spoke Chinese. And um, we thought, let's, let's get a data set. So we got a data set, um, which, came in a, um, which came with the, each individual post and the URL attached to the post. Um, we then um, uh, uh, analyzed the data. We tried to see whether it would work in Chinese. And of course, Chinese works very differently than English. And uh, uh, most things work. Some didn't. And then we improved the methods. So everything was great. And then at some point towards the end, I said to Jen and Molly, hey, why don't you guys click on some of the, those URLs? Because we got the whole database all at once. And I said, why don't you click on some of those URLs and go back to the website from which the posts came <coughs> And then try to figure out, you know, make sure that we understand the context, right? Because we had just pulled the, the posts out of their natural habitat. Go see how they act in their habitat, right? Uh, make sure we're not pulling the ads. Make sure we really are getting the posts. Make sure we understand what's going on. So they came back to my office, and we were sitting around. And they said, you know, I think this, uh, they said, we think there's something wrong with the database and the source of the data that we got from, uh, we got it from Crimson Hexagon, which is a startup company that I helped found with some of the technology that we're talking about today. And um, they said, we think there's something wrong with, the, with the, the post, because sometimes you click on it, and it goes back to the website. Sometimes you click on it, and it doesn't go anywhere. And sometimes you click on it, and it talks about being investigated. And we thought, oh, wait a second. So we have all the social media posts that, that were posted in China. And we were able to get them before the Chinese government could censor them. And we thought, Forget this study about automated text analysis. <laughs> okay. We're doing a study of Chinese censorship. So now the dependent variable on millions of Chinese language social media posts is zero or one, censored or not censored. Okay. Okay, so that, that's basically what the, post, what the story is. We wrote two papers. The first is an observational study. The second, um, which is, it says is under review, but just between us, it's coming out in science um, on, uh, on August 22nd, actually. Um, and this has an experimental study where we randomly assign posts and a participatory study, which I'll explain. We actually participated in the process. It's a lot of fun. Um, so let me explain what, we're, what this is about. Chinese censorship is the largest selective suppression of human expression in the history of the world. It's really quite amazing. It's implemented manually, that is, by hand, by human beings. Within a few hours of each social media post being posted, 
uh, around 200,000 people inside government and inside social media firms read all the posts and they decide whether to leave it up or take it down. That's how they do it. Imagine you were in charge of this, right? right so first you hire 200,000 of your closest, closest friends and best students, okay? <laughs> and you get them together in a room slightly larger than this one. And you explain, okay, here's what we're gonna do, okay? What we wanna do in the study is try to figure out what they said. Well, not actually what they said, but what they actually do. Because how would you get these people to do what it is you want? My gosh, this would be hard. Okay, and this is a huge censorship organization, and what we finally realized is that, although it is obviously designed for the sole purpose of suppressing information, it's paradoxically very revealing about the goals and intentions and actions of the Chinese leadership. It's like a giant elephant tiptoeing around. It leaves, sorry, it leaves big footprints, okay? And so since it leaves big footprints, we can go see them. Okay, so to give you a feel of what Chinese social media is like, um, in, the, in the US and in most of Europe, there's a small number of large social media companies, t uh, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. In China, there's a large number, there's some big companies, but there's a large number of smaller companies. We found 1,400 of them. There's probably a good deal more. This is a collage, by the way. The American Political Science Review let us publish a collage. Isn't that, <laughs> isn't that great? <laughs> um, uh, also, this is a pie chart, which is usually not the preferred method of presenting information, but it's such a beautiful one, we thought we'd publish that too. <laughs> um, so you can see the size of these, of these, they go from big into very, 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 very small. And there's a really long tail of, of, uh, social, of social media companies and the size of them, which is very interesting actually, because we know where they are. For a lot of these companies, in order to use one of these social media companies, you have to actually be in that locality. You have to have a local telephone number. So they're not, they're, a lot of them are not national companies. Um, so what's the goal of social media? Excuse me, what's the goal of social media censorship? Okay, well, it's obvious, everybody sort of knows the goal. It's to stop criticism, protest, and collective action about the state, its leaders, and their policies, right? And the first thing we did is we gathered all the data, we looked at this goal, and the first thing we learned was, nope, okay, it's totally wrong, okay? So this, is the, this was the thing that really surprised us, that basically what everybody thought, what we thought, it was just totally wrong. Now, instead of giving you an alternative theory, I'm actually gonna give you the alternative truth, because remember, we, we're calling it reverse engineering, which sounds really cool. What it really is, is it's a theory that totally fits the data, okay? <laughs> After the fact, okay? So it will be correct, okay? Um, okay, so, this was wrong, so what is it that they're after? What could be the goal? What we did is we realized we could separate out two separate things. One thing is that the goal might be to stop criticism of the state. If you were in charge of social media in China, social media censorship in China, and people were saying bad things about you, you might censor just a few of them, right? So that's the first thing. Second, and which we realized and nobody else had really realized, and we didn't realize before, was separate from criticism of the state, is stopping collective action. Stopping the arrangement of, uh, stopping the movement of people to, to um, protest or rally or whatever it is. And we realized that these two things were separate. We did a study, here's what the results are. The first is wrong, the second is right. As a political scientist, I don't usually get to use words like that, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> but the results, as I'll show you, are quite unambiguous. Um, you can say the nastiest things about the leaders of China. You can say um, the leaders of this town are slimes. They, <clears throat> they all have mistresses, here are their names, okay? You can say they're stealing money, here's how much money, and here's where, they are. here's where the money is in overseas bank accounts. That will not be censored. If, however, you say, um, and therefore, let's go protest, let's, right, let's, go have a, let's go have a protest rally, that will be censored. Right. In fact, if you say the leaders of this town, <clears throat> they're um, doing such a wonderful job for the community that um, we should go have a rally in support of them, right, in support of them, that will be censored too. They don't care what you say about them, they only care what you do, okay? If you have the ability to move crowds in China, you will be stopped, okay? If you want to say whatever is on your mind, they don't care. 
Okay? So that's, that's the finding. Okay? I have to explain it to you, I have to prove it to you, but that's, that's the finding. Um, so the cool thing about this is that, is that these findings make social media actionable for the Chinese leaders, and it makes social media actionable for us as scholars. So for the Chinese leaders, they allow criticism on the web. Now, you might ask, why is that? Why would they allow criticism on the web? So here's our theory. <clears throat> Imagine now, instead of being in head of the Chinese um, censorship program, let's promote you. Now you're ahead of the whole country. Okay? You have more power than, than um, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett combined. You can do anything you want, pretty much. Okay? So um, what, do, what do you want to do? You want to do the same thing that pretty much any other leader wants? You want to keep a good thing going. You want to stay in office. So, how do, you, how do you stay in office? First thing you do is there's about 50,000 towns and cities in China. You appoint 100,000 of your closest friends, the head of the, of the government and the head of the Chinese party in each of these areas. So you have to find 100,000 people that you trust, okay, so that's pretty hard. Um, and even if you trust them at first, they're all gonna be stealing money and doing whatever it is they do. <coughs> and so, you have to watch them. Some of them won't have been good appointments. Some of them won't be doing a good job. How are you going to know how good a job they do? Well, following them in social media is actually a pretty good way. If they're not doing a good job mollifying the people, which is their goal, then you'll be able to see because there'll be a lot of criticism. So the criticism in social media, far from being something that they're afraid of, is actually something that they get to use to control their country. Everybody see what I mean? Did anybody hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> um, and of course, what they need to do is to stop the one thing that they're afraid of. The one thing that, the Chinese, that can get the Chinese leaders to lose power is the Chinese people. The governments of, of, uh, of the rest of the world are not going to intervene and, and take their power away from them, but the Chinese people might. And so stopping collective action is totally in their interest. So they stop collective action. They don't stop criticism. The criticism actually helps them. Okay, so given that that's their goal, if I can prove to you that that's their goal, how can that, how can that be useful for us? Well, it turns out that um, it enables us to make really clear predictions. We can tell you which, of, which local officials in China are in trouble and which ones are likely to be replaced. And we can predict ahead of time which ones are going to be replaced. We know which policies generate dissent and the interests of the leaders. We, <clears throat> we know um, when the government will take action outside the internet. Uh, for example, uh, which dissidents are going to be arrested? Like we know ahead of time wh when they're going to pick up a dissident. We know, um, not every time, but with higher probability. We, <clears throat> we've predicted that peace treaties are going to be signed. We know when scandals are emerging. Uh, we can see very clearly di disagreements um, based upon different censorship behavior between the central government and local leaders. All right. So uh, this is tremendously informative. It's a big prize. But you only get to believe me that, this, that we get to do these things if we have the goals right. So I have to show you now that we have the goals right. Everybody with me? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so first I'm going to describe our observational research design, then the experimental one, then the participatory one. So here's our observational research design. Five steps. First, the first one is we pick 85 different content areas. Okay? Now, you can't just look at all of social media because in China, they also have an, uh, have an obsession with cat videos just like we do. Okay. So, so, they're, so they're paying very close attention to all kinds of things, every manner of, of a sporting figure and, and movie actress and you name it. Um, so we pick 85 topic areas related to policies and politics that, are, that would be of interest to, to this crowd, basically. And we monitor them over six months. Um, <clears throat> how do we do that? Well, for six months in each of these 85 topic areas, um, I have to sort of not get myself excited, so excuse me. Anyway, so what we have to do is download each and every social media post the instant it appears. Right? So the moment it appears, we grab it. Um, then we revisit each one later to see if it was censored. So how do, how do we do that? Well, you know, imagine you're writing a little script yourself to do it. We, we can grab it the moment, it the moment it appears, and then we just go back to see if it was censored. Well, the problem is it might not have been censored then, it might be censored a little later. So we just go back and check again, and we check again, and we check again, and we check again. Are you there? 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 And, it was, it was, and we, <clears throat> what we finally realized is that's what's known as a denial of service attack. Right. <laughs> no, that's how you shut down computers, right? And that's how the computer, the, the server, will stop you. And we didn't want them to stop us, of course. 
So what we did is we used a network of computers all over the world, and we would check once from here, and once from here, and once from here, and once from here. That's, uh, someone explained to me that that's known as a distributed denial of service attack. <laughs> um, but our goal is not to influence or change anything that happens in the Chinese system. Our goal is only to observe. So we did it, we did it in a way that wouldn't mess with anything that was going on there. And we, in a very subtle way, we just tried to figure out what was going on. And in this particular case, what was censored and, ex and exactly when. So fourth, we just repeat the same thing 11 million times. So now we're up to the big data part, okay? <clears throat> We've actually repeated the first four steps here many, many times. We're up to hundreds of millions of, 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 of social media posts. Um, and finally, we use these new methods of um, computer-assisted text analysis to try to figure out what was going on. And, we, and basically, we label each one of the 11 million posts as censored or not censored. And then we go back and we try to figure out, well, what, what, what were the factors that led to censorship or not censorship? Okay, so just, just to give you a feel for it, the Chinese leaders are not embarrassed about censorship, okay? So here's an example of a page. It says, sorry, the host you were looking for does not exist, has been deleted, or in case you are still not sure what we're talking about, <laughs> is being investigated, <laughs> okay? Um, and then my favorite one is, the page you requested is temporarily down. How about you go look at another page? <laughs> <laughs> and if that is not sufficient, in the bottom right-hand corner is Jing Jing. Can you look, look closely? This is a little cartoon police officer, um, which is known as Jing Jing. And it's just, they just leave him there just to know that we're watching you. Okay. So coding the outcome variable for us, no big deal. Okay. Okay, this, the first question is how long does it take them to do this? There's millions and millions of social media posts. Um, so we, we took an example, I'm gonna show you an example of this. There was a subway crash in, in uh, Shanghai. There were protests over it, so it was a big, a big activity where um, there was a lot of collective action, therefore a lot of censorship. So this is a histogram of how, of how long the post took to be censored. And that's zero days, one days, two days, and this is just how many were piled up. And as you can see, almost all the censorship that was going to happen in this, in this event happened within the first day, usually within a few hours. Okay? So if you think about that, that is amazing. Right? There's millions of social media posts, and they make a decision, even if it's the wrong one, they make a decision about millions of, indiv they make millions of individual decisions within a few hours, continuously, round the clock. Okay, <clears throat> so in order to analyze this massive quantity of data that's spewing in all the time, we have to understand one important thing about social media. Social, um, the, so a, a key thing about social media in China and about social media in the United States and in the UK and, and everywhere, um, it's bursty. So let me explain this graph because I'm gonna show you a number of graphs like this. The vertical axis is the volume. So gray is the total number of posts in this particular area. And this, this particular area <coughs> are posts about, about an, environmental, an environmental lottery. Okay. He's coughing for me. Um, so an environmental lottery is, there's a, there's a lottery. You know, where you bet money, but put $2 in and you try to get money back. And the proceeds for the lottery go to environmental causes. Okay. Um, and so we were monitoring this particular content area, and the gray is the total number of posts, you can see. And, and there was a big burst of activity here. And then the, the red is the amount censored. Okay. This burst, by the way, in this one area, was collective support for this environmental lottery. So there were a whole bunch of people who were thrilled about this policy. They really liked this public policy, and they poured out and in order to support the leaders of the town that had this policy. And you can see the gray, the gray spikes are very high because there was a lot of discussion on social media about this collective event. But remember, I told you collective events are censored. And you can see the red, they followed them right up the hill and they took most of them down, even though it was in support of the local leaders who were in charge of censorship. Okay. Okay, so volume bursts are an essential component of social media. If we're gonna analyze social media, we have to focus on the volume bursts. We found, through some methods we developed, in the 85 topic areas, we found 87 volume bursts. So in some topic areas there were none, in some there were one, in some there were two, et cetera. So the volume bursts are really essential. We then, we then looked at each burst, 
and we figured out what was the real world event that that, that that burst was talking about, that the posts in that burst were talking about. It's not hard to do because they're all pretty much about the same thing. They talk in many, many different ways, some in support, some opposed, uh, but um, they were all about the same event. So we, we figure out what the event is. Um, that connects social media to something in the real world. And then here's our hypothesis. Again, it's true, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you is that the government censors all the posts in the volume burst, so, it, so they identify the volume burst, and they try to get all the posts in the volume burst associated with real-world events with collective action potential. They don't care how critical or supportive of the state they are. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. They look for the volume burst. They then figure out, is the volume burst related to an event that has collective action potential. That is, you know, there's real collective action on the ground, et cetera. I'll explain that in more detail. Um, and if it does, they try to take down everything having to do with, the, with those posts. If any of you have done um, uh, hand coding, how many people have done hand coding of something or another, you know, putting stuff in categories, okay? What's your level of intercoder reliability, right? It's very difficult, I mean, as you know. I won't, I won't make you say that in public, don't worry. Uh, it's very, very hard. Anybody that gets above 80%, I wouldn't even believe it, right? Now you're in charge of 200,000 very low-paid workers. Can you imagine doing that with precision? It would be very hard. On the other hand, this task is doable. You just figure out, is the post related to the event? And if it's related to the event, take it down. Don't try to figure out whether it's supportive or, or opposed. Don't read the post that says, you know, I think this is a great thing, but it would be better if it were this, but I really don't really support it usually, except maybe I will this time, right? Don't, you know, just figure out how to code that. Instead, if it is an event related to a collective action potential, we just take it down. That's much easier to code. That's why we, can, we believe they can actually accomplish this. Okay, um, so first test, um, we're just going to look at the volume of the posts. We're going to start with our 85 um, volume bursts, and we're going to calculate our measure of censorship, which is going to be censorship inside the bur burst minus the baseline outside the burst. If you want to think of that as just percent censored, that's totally cool. If the goal of collective action, excuse me, if the goal of censorship is to stop collective action, what we expect is that on average the percent censored should increase during volume bursts and for some bursts the, the um, percent censored should be much higher. So here's a histogram of this censor, censorship magnitude. And here's here's the, the bird's eye view of what it looks like. Um, <clears throat> most of the posts are, um, are basically normally distributed around zero, which is the baseline. And then there's a long right tail. And these are the ones I hypothesize are related to collective action potential, but I gotta show you them, okay? So this is just the first few. So let's now take this histogram and zoom in a little further, okay? <clears throat> so to zoom in, what we have to do is take each of the events and put them in a category. We have to figure out whether they are collective action potential events or they're some other type of events, okay? Remember, in each, in each event type, they may be supportive of the government or opposed, they don't care about that. So we're just gonna look at the type. So first type is collective action potential. So let me just define this a little more precisely so you have it. It is um, an event that involves actual protest and organized crowd formation of some type outside the internet. It could be supportive or opposed to the state. They don't care. Um, it could also be related to individuals who have incited some type, to, some type of collection, collective action on the ground in the past. If they've proven their ability to move crowds and, and there's another event about that individual, that's collective action potential. And finally, topics related to nationalism or nationalist sentiment that have incited protest or collective action in the past. That's our precise definition of collective action. Um, our intercoder reliability on this is 98.9%, which is almost ridiculous, but it's very, very clear, right? It makes sense. They can follow these rules, okay? Um, Okay, so that's first category, collective action potential. We found the bursts. We then figured out the event related to the burst. We then put them in one of these categories. That's category one. Second category, oh, by the way, I, I, I should mention, um, so far I've only told you one thing they censor. It turns out there's two smaller categories of stuff they censor, okay? So first one is the weirdest of them all. Okay, so they, you can criticize any member of the Chinese leadership, including the top leader, you can criticize your local leader. The only people in China you can't criticize are the people who run the censorship program. <laughs> Isn't that great? In the list of the world's inappropriate things, this one is pretty weird. <laughs> you know, I don't even think the Chinese leaders were aware of this fact. And 
and my secret, my secret um, uh, hope is when we go back and study this again, that they found out from our, from our paper and then they made it go away. <laughs> you know, you know, I have no idea if that's true, but it would just be so cool if it is. Um, so that's the second one that actually, in the small number of events that are actually about um, criticism of the censors, they actually do censor those. <clears throat> There's one other category. Oh, and by the way, you can tell whether it's criticism of the censors. Intercoder reliability here is pretty high as well when they're throwing shoes at the, at the guy that runs the censorship program. That's, that's a, and then they're all protesting about it. It's very clear that falls into the category of, of criticism of the censors. Okay. Third, the third category uh, is pornography. You know, it's no surprise, right? Every single government in the world censors some form of pornography, whether it's child pornography. Or it's, people are basically obsessed with sex. Um, and so they also censor. It's not like there's no pornography in China. It's not like there's no pornography on the Chinese internet. Um, but they, they do try to censor pornography. Um, we, of course, took all of these posts and reserved them for future study. So that was a joke. So. <laughs> okay. Um, so those are our three categories that are censored. Uh, we also have other news of every possible type, um, and then uh, government policies of all different, all different types. And just, just, so you, just to remind us, collective action potential is censored, criticism of the, cens of the censors are censored, pornography is censored, um, other news is okay, and government policies are okay, and they're not censored. Uh, you can say anything you want about government policies and about any new subject. Okay, so that's our, this is our categorization. Now I'm going to take that histogram that I showed you just a minute ago, and I'm going to zoom in, but I'm going to categorize each of the events by this categorization scheme. And this is what it looks like. Remember that long tail to the right? Okay, so that, this is the same, same histogram, but I've now just colored in each of the events. And you, as you can see, it's really quite unambiguous. On the left here is policy of all sorts and uh, you know, government policy of all sorts and news of all different types. And on the right, the colorful colors are collective action, criticism of the censors, and pornography. Okay, everybody, everybody see? Okay. Um, let's zoom in a little further and you can get a feel for what some of these are. Um, I've listed the, ranked them from most censored all the way down to least censored. Uh, I've cut the ones out in the middle because I knew your screen wouldn't quite be large enough. Um, so uh, up at the top is uh, uh, protests in Inner Mongolia, um, pornography disguised as news, they, they disguise pornography in all kinds of different ways, a Baidu copyright lawsuit, which is basically criticism of the censors, uh, protests in Zhenzhen, um, uh, Ai Weiwei, who's a, who's a dissident, do you remember the, the last Winter Olympics in this, gigantic, this beautiful stadium that looked like a bird's nest, do you remember this? Right, so that was designed by, by Ai Weiwei, and then after the Olympics, he became a dissident. He started, he started tweeting about the Jasmine Spring, which is sort of like the Arab Spring. Um, anyway, so you can see up at the top, these are collective action events. Down at the bottom, popular book published in audio format, really important uh, event. Disney theme park announced, I might censor that. Uh, Chinese solar company announces earnings. You know, no, no, there's no collective action on the bottom here. Okay, let's zoom in a little more. Okay, this is uh, one of the things we were monitoring was Zhenzhen, which is a city in China. That's where they make lychee nuts. They grow lychee nuts, I guess. Um, so this is the volume of posts about Zhenzhen. And what happened was there were riots there one day. And so the number of posts about those riots just soared. And you can see they followed them right up the hill and took, all, took down as many of those posts as they could. Okay. Uh, another example is uh, Ai Weiwei, the guy, the guy I just mentioned. <clears throat> um, uh, we're, we're following them. This is the, the number of posts about Ai Weiwei. Uh, it was pretty clear that, that um, something was going to happen. They arrest, they arrest him. Uh, there's an enormous number of discussion about social media posts about Ai Weiwei, and they don't want this guy uh, uh, to have any press, and they take, take it all down. It's collective action. They censor it. Okay. What about um, a policy that, that it's hard to imagine one that would be less controversial? The one-child policy. You can, I mean, you can only have one kid. Okay, right? But there was no collective action event during the six months that we had here. There were lots of events, but no collective action events. This was an enormous discussion about uh, about whether they were going to reverse the policy um, uh, <clears throat> at a at, at a at a big um, um, National People's Congress event. Um, and so lots of discussion, but nothing on the ground. No protests. No no nothing. So it was not censored. Okay. Uh, power prices. Power prices create um, lots of protests all through the, all through the developed world. Right? 
Um, and so here there's uh, you know, lots of spikes, lots of discussion, volume bursts, but no censorship. Everybody say? Okay. Okay, so let's zoom in even further. <clears throat> let's look at the content of the posts. Um, so uh, to do this, we adapted um, an algorithm. I'm going to skip some of the math, but this is an algorithm. You can get it on the web. Um, <clears throat> there's a piece of software called README um, to uh, understand the, what is in these posts. So this, is, this is the point at which it's not possible for any of us in, individuals to read all these posts, so we need some kind of technology to, uh, um, to understand it. So I'm just going to skip a page of... Uh, of that kind of stuff. Okay, so like, I'll show you show you how it works. This was this was actually the goal of our analysis, right? It didn't have anything to do with China. Um, what we did is we took uh, a thousand social media posts and we we had individuals hand coded just as as you guys said you did into these four categories. This on labor strikes, we had facts supporting employers, supporting workers, opinions supporting workers, opinions uh, supporting employers, or or irrelevant. Um, <clears throat> we found we took a hundred and we analyzed them. We had 900 as our test set. We were going to try to predict what was in the 900 from the 100. So our computer algorithm was going to analyze the 100. We're going to try to predict what was in the 900. Um, in the 900, 20% um, was in this category, 25 was in this category, 50% was in this category, I don't know, 15% is in this category. We run our algorithm on the 900 without, no, without revealing to our algorithm the fact that we actually know what the answer is, and it works very well. Okay, so for this purpose, we can use our method of automated text analysis. This was, we were going to write a paper about this. Okay. Now, it's, now it's in Appendix A. Okay, um, <clears throat> okay so um, let me show you some of the, resu some of the results now. Um, so we have uh, non-collective action posts which are not censored. It okay? doesn't matter whether they're supportive or critical of the state. Since they're not collective action posts, they're not going to be censored. And here's our three examples, one-child policy, corruption policy, and food price increases. Um, in each one, we can, we can calculate the vertical axis here, which is the percent censored, among the posts which criticize the state and among the posts which, which support the state. And that is, in this case, supporting the policy. So whether you criticize the one-child policy or support the one-child policy, the levels of censorship are very low. Whether you, whether you criticize or support the corruption policy, censorship is very low. Whether you criticize or support food price increases, censorship is, is very low. Okay. What about collective action events? This is non-collective action events. So for collective action events, um, regardless of whether it's critical or supportive, they're going to be censored. So here's our three events. Ai Weiwei, very high levels of censorship. Remember, the vertical axis here is the percent censored. Red is criticize. Green is support what the state did. It's actually higher than, than, than uh, supporting the state is actually a higher levels of censorship than criticizing the state. A bombing in Fuzhou with protests about it uh, and riots in Inner, Inner Mongolia. And you, as you can see, there's there's very high level, levels of censorship, regardless of whether they, the posts are critical of the state or supportive of the state. To some extent, there are even higher, support, higher levels of censorship supporting than opposing the state, but I think it just, they just don't care. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you say about them. It matters what you do. Okay, so I, t I promised you two other research designs, which I'll, I'll, let me explain in a little, more, um, little quicker. So first of all, <clears throat> we did a randomized experiment. All right, to make causal inferences. And second, we did a participatory study for descriptive inferences. So let me explain each of these. A randomized experiment, we selected 100 top social media sites all over China. Um, we created two accounts on each site. To create two accounts on each site where you had to be local for most of these places was sort of a big task, okay? To send people out, attach, attach string to them so you can bring them back in, you know? Uh, um, so we create these accounts, we created, we created 200 accounts on, on social media sites all over China. Um, we then wrote 1,200 unique Chinese language social media posts. I mean, I personally wrote all of them. Well, not all of them, actually none of them. Um, but I did hire some people who wrote them. Um, and some of them were collective action, that is, they supported collective action. Some of them didn't support collective action. Some of them were opposed to the state. Some of them were, were, were in favor of the state. Or that is what the state did. Uh, we then randomly submitted posts of different types to, uh, to these um, uh, 200 accounts to see what would happen. 
And then we checked on, on censorship after the fact from this network of computers around the world to see which of these types were censored. Okay, so that's our randomized experiment. Let me explain our participatory study, which was actually very useful to figure out what experiment to run. <clears throat> so, the current method of learning how the censorship program actually works is to do good qualitative research, to do some combination of journalism and ethnography and participant observation and, you know, you, you, how do you do this stuff? You guys know how to do this stuff, right? It's not easy, right? You ask some, you do interviews. You ask someone to step out of their life to give something of their life to your research project. Who the heck are we to ask them to do that, okay? Um, but we are, because we're gonna do things in the interests of the world, right? Okay, nevertheless. Um, but in this case, we're gonna interview somebody that is a censor. So it's probably not entirely safe for them to do this, or maybe not appropriate, and maybe it's not really good for us to do it. And at worst, or at best, it's uncomfortable, okay? And what kind of answers will we get from these people? Right? What kind of answers do you usually get from people? It's not entirely clear. But what kind of answers do you get from censors when their goal is to censor and we're asking them to reveal? Okay? So it's pretty difficult. And there's been a lot of efforts, including by us, but and, as well as others, to talk to people to try to figure out how it works. There are, there are uh, several hundred thousand of these folks, and so you can actually get them to talk sometimes. But it's not entirely clear what they're saying. So, we needed to change their incentives. How do you change their incentives? And when we, were, we weren't going to do it by paying them or threatening them, okay? How do you change their incentives? So here's our procedure. We created our own social media website in China. So China, it turns out, is a capitalist country. You can do stuff like this, okay? So we purchased a URL, you know, the, the web address. We, um, <clears throat> there are the, there is 1,400 or more social media sites all over China. We bought, we bought server space. Right? We, we contracted with a small number of firms that create the software to put on the servers to create the social media sites. So we bought the same software that the social media companies have. We installed it ourselves. Um, we, we didn't let the Chinese people post on our site because then we'd have to be censors. You know? But you know, I would post, my graduate student would censor me, so I'd censor it right back. You know, um, but we'd, we'd play with the software. Have you ever tried to figure out how something's, something works and been privileged enough to have the documentation of how it works, right? Or you can actually run the thing and see, see what happens. And the cool thing was, um, uh, not only could we try every software option and read the documentation and you know, see, see what happens if you, if you tried different things, but if we really didn't really know how something worked, we actually had somebody whose incentives were completely changed. We just called customer support. <laughs> and we said, hey, how do, how do we stay out of trouble with the Chinese government? And you know what they said? They said, I have to sort of slap my knee. They said, let me tell you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and they were very helpful. They're really good at their jobs, I'll tell you. Um, so we really got a sense. We really got to understand how it was they did what they did. And from this, we got to learn the mechanisms of, of censorship. So this is, this is sort of our map of what censorship looks like. And from this, we designed our experiment. So here's how it works. You submit a text for posting, and then it is either published immediately, or if you use certain keywords you know, that is in their list, then it gets fed into this purgatory, and it doesn't get posted right away. It just gets put into purgatory. If it was posted immediately, the censors will read the post within a few hours, and it'll either leave it online, or they will take it down. Okay. If it went into this purgatory, if it got into this automated review, it's called, because you happen to use one of the bad keywords, then instead of deciding whether a post should be taken down, they'll read it and decide whether to put it up. Everybody see? Okay. So the cool thing about this is that there's different processes. Everybody had noticed that there were both things going on, but we can sort of see both. The problem for us was we did this observational study that we really liked, but the observational study only studied part of the system. It could only study the posts that made it up to the web. The ones that didn't make it to the web, if we were just observing, we couldn't tell. That's why we did the experimental study. The experimental study, we observe everything that happens from that point. So if it, if it, never, if it never appeared on the web after we submitted it, we would know that. Okay? So that's, that's, why, that's why we did it. That's the observational study. Moreover, 64% of websites do some of this automated review. Some of them, you know, about a third of them don't, but a lot of them do. And, and about 40% of all submissions make it into that review process. And some of them get, get posted, some of them don't. Okay. So um, what do we find? Um, 
So first thing is we're going to look at the causal effect of posting something for the state or against the state, for the government or against the government. No effect. Okay. So here's the vertical axis here is the, the um, censorship difference between pro and anti uh, posts for or against the government. And the causal effect uh, of um, this, these protests in Pensu was zero. Okay. So it doesn't, that's the causal effect of writing a post in favor of the protest or against the protest. Everybody see? Zero. In fact, there's a theme here. Okay. Uh, Tibetan self-immolations. So the, the, the Tibetans, they, the monks will sometimes light themselves on fire as a, as a protest. And then there'll be a lot of uh, protests as a result of that. Um, that all gets censored. If you write a post for it, which the government hates, it doesn't get censored any more than if you write it against it. Um, and there's uh, Ai Weiwei's, Ai Weiwei, incidentally, nobody's interrupted me yet even once. Sorry? Ai Weiwei. Ai Weiwei? Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Ai Weiwei. Ai Weiwei. It's the emphasis is on the first syllable. Okay. Okay. Um, anybody else want to interrupt me? You should feel free. <laughs> okay. Um, protests in, I mean, you can see, basically. Okay. So the causal effect, it doesn't matter what the topic area is. If you write posts for the government or against the government, um, the first, they're, they're not censored anymore. The first four of these were all collective action events. The rest of them were not collective action events. It doesn't matter. For the state or against the state, they don't care. What about collective action versus not collective action? In this case, the, the effects are very large. Everybody see? So this is the causal effect of writing something that is uh, a about a collective action event versus not. And it's very large. OK. OK. <clears throat> I'm going to give you one more story, and then I'm going to stop. Um, so except for my friend here, does anybody, does every, everyone knows what this means, right? Oh, yeah. See, I said except for my friend. <laughs> That's right. So this means freedom. If you write that, that will be um, filtered into automated review. OK. So that means freedom. Um, that's censored. Uh, anybody know what, knows what that is? See, you see the difference there? So that means I field. That has no meaning at all. Okay? No meaning at all. And the Chinese people are very clever, of course. They uh, swap the second one for the first one. And they say, we think there should be much more I fields in China. Okay? <laughs> and it doesn't get caught in the, in the, um, in the, um, in the automated review process. Okay? Uh, this is called a homograph. Okay. Here's, a, here's another example. Um, this, uh, which means harmonious society, it's the official slogan of the government. They probably don't want you talking about this. Um, that's censored. This, which um, doesn't look the same, but it sounds the same. It's, uh, it, it means river crab. Okay? It has no particular meaning at all. Um, they both sound like the word hexes. That's not about right. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, so they'll, they'll say, boy, the, the policy of the harmonious society really sucks. That would get taken down. But if you say, the policy of the river crab is really horrible, no problem. Okay. Um, so they can't follow the conversation because they don't have, they don't, they don't have um, the technology to be able to swap one for the other and to figure out all of the many different types of innovations you can have in language. If, I, if you said a sentence and I picked out two words from that sentence and I said, can you communicate the same thing without those two words? No problem, right? We could all do that. Same thing with, same thing with people in, Ch in Chinese social media. So it's very hard for the Chinese leaders to follow them. Um, of course, we're studying what's going on there. So even though they couldn't do it, we had to figure out how to do it, right? So. Um, uh, so we developed, we developed these, uh, these um, new keyword methods that can follow the conversation even when the words change. Um, and uh, there's other kinds of app applications to it as well. So uh, it, about a year ago in Boston, there was a bombing. I don't know if you, you followed it, but there was in Twitter, it was hashtag Boston bombings. And then at some point during it, all the people of Boston got really pissed off with everything being closed. And so they stopped using hashtag Boston bombings and they started using hashtag Boston strong. They felt very proud and stuff. But that basically meant if you were, if you were doing a search for Boston bombings, you would lose track of what was going on. So same exact, same exact problem. There's people like pedophiles and stuff hiding in plain sight or modeling or actually, if you want to find a data scientist, there's about 100 different names or a methodologist, right? 
Think of all the names that mean methodologist, right? This is very important in case any of us want to find a job, okay? <laughs> right, but there are about 100, 100 different names, you know, psychometrician, data scientist, data wrangler, you can imagine, right? So how do you find those? Same exact, same exact technology. Um, in fact, any kind of sophisticated automated text analysis has basically the same, the same, kind, of, same kind of problem. In any event, um, the goals of Chinese censorship, I want you to remember one phrase, for the Chinese people, Freedom of speech is individually free, but collectively in chains. That's sort of the situation of the Chinese people, okay? Individually free, but collectively in chains. Um, there's pretty unambiguous evidence from these different types of studies. Um, it uh, makes social, understanding what the goals are makes social media actionable for us. We can, we have detailed continuous predictive monitoring of uh, basically as many government leaders and policies and dissidents and scandals and companies as you like. Uh, we can predict state action outside the internet when other sources are silent. We've done a few studies where, where we uh, observe censorship and all of a sudden censorship will increase and four or five days later they'll pick up the dissident we were watching. Um, <clears throat> it may be applicable to certain other countries that we're having a peek at at the moment. Um, and then uh, we have some new methods for following conversations where people try to evade censors or just morph language just to be creative. Um, and uh, I think I'll leave it at that. So I'm um, happy to take your questions or um, 